All right, good evening, everyone. Um, before I introduce our speaker, who I'm very excited about, Miguel Aragon, I would uh, like to thank uh, SNAP uh, for their partnership in making this talk poss possible. It's always great when we can work together like that. So uh, this evening, uh, Miguel Aragon is here, and he Miguel got his MF, or sorry, his BFA from the University of Texas at El Paso. And uh, that work, as I think you'll start living there, very much influenced his work, as you'll see. He got his MFA at the University of Te Texas in Austin. Uh, he's had a very, since graduating with his MFA, he's had a very active career, and I will not uh, go over all of his uh, CV by any means, because it's far too long, but I just wanted to highlight a few things. Um, first of all, he's now an assistant professor at Cooney College at Staten Island. Um, he's had five solo exhibitions since completing his MFA, including an upcoming exhibition at the University of Tulsa. Uh, and uh, tomorrow night opening at SNAP, he has a solo exhibition at SNAP, which opens at seven. So you better be there. Uh, come on out, it's a great show, I'm sure. Uh, he's had numerous uh, uh, group exhibitions all around uh, North America and internationally including a uh, group exhibition at the Musée de Politica de Drogas in Mexico City, uh, the 2017 North America Print Biennale uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, Art Now Printmaking Ann Arbor Art Center, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and at the Kala Institute in uh, San Francisco, and I was fortunate enough to see that exhibition. It was a terrific mm. exhibition. So, um, so it's shown a great deal around the world. Uh, numerous selected awards, including uh, the Otis Philbrick Memorial Prize, the London Art Center, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, looks like you recently got a research award from Cooney, <laughs> Cooney, yeah. Cooney which is great. Uh, the Print Center Honorable Honorary Council Award of Excellence, the Print Center, Philadelphia. So, uh, and numerous other awards. And also, he's in uh, numerous uh, prestigious collections, in including the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston the Minneapolis Institute of Art, Minneapolis uh, National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, and the Kyoto International Woodprint Association, Kyoto, Japan. So I'll end there, and please help me in welcoming Miguel uh, this evening. Uh, well, thanks, John, and April, and everybody at SNAP, and everybody here at the U of A. It's been really a fantastic visit so far, so Thank you all for having me. Um, I'm going to start by actually taking a picture of all of you guys. I'm going to put you on that one spotlight. I like doing this every time I uh, do presentations, and every now and then I forget. So I'm glad that I remember this time. Um, I'm also going to try to time myself, because I tend to run over sometimes. So just kind of bear with me. And if you have questions throughout the presentation, by all means, you can ask me, actually. I mean, I know traditionally we kind of wait until the end and then we kind of, you know, ask the questions. But a lot of times we kind of have to go back to the slide. So by all means, be, you know, you can interrupt me at any point. Um, I'm assuming it's already here, the presentation. All right. So I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of a background of where I come from. I was born in Juarez, Mexico, which is a border town with El Paso, Texas. So as you can see, this is Mexico, and which is basically divided by the, uh, the Rio Grande or the Rio Bravo, uh, and this is El Paso, Texas. So we're twin city, uh, tw uh, sister cities, and everybody in the border region, I mean, we all kind of have family on both sides of the border, and before 9-11, it was a pretty open border in the sense that we were able to actually come back and forth uh, all the time without much hassle. Now after 9-11, it's been more difficult and as you all probably are aware with our new current president in the US has been even more toxic, you know, politics than that. So going back and forth between the two countries is pretty easy. It's basically just crossing a bridge. It's as simple as that. So. You know, within five minutes, if there was no traffic at all, you would actually be in another country. Um, and the reason that I'm showing you this is just so that you can get a sense of what I'm, what I'm going to start talking about later on. Um, so I grew up in this, in this region. And then in 2006, unfortunately, uh, a, an official war on drugs was declared in Mexico. Uh, all of, in the whole country. And because Juarez being a border town and being one of the biggest border towns, violence spiked up a lot uh, because then they started, you know, obviously trying to capture all the, the kingpins 
and uh, everybody was trying to basically capture the the plaza, which is how they called it, the the cartels and the ofi the the, the, the uh, officials as well of uh, Juarez, you know, because it was one of the main corridors for the drugs to go from Mexico into the U.S. So this was nothing new for us living in the border. Um, I've been actually following these events since um, like the mid '90s, uh, because in the <coughs> in the region uh, there were always violence. But it was what I called at the point at the time in closed doors, meaning that the cartels were you know doing um, they were going about their businesses and trying to keep it away from the population. You know they didn't want to create chaos because they don't want to attract attention to themselves. So, but you know, every now and then, violence or you know somebody would pop up somewhere, and we kind of knew that it was because of this uh, cartel wars that was happening, or the police kind of working with them or trying to capture them, and so it was pretty quiet or pretty safe before that. After two, uh, 2006, when the, or the, the official war was declared, this is what the city looked like. Um, the president at the time decided that we needed more security, so he sent. Um, several garrisons of uh, federal police and eventually even the army so our sh city changed from one day to the next you know being uh, a very safe city and very um, kind of friendly I would say into a city being in a state of, of uh, basically fear and horror now this is a, uh, the first city of body of work that I kind of feel that started made me jump into the work that I'm doing now and this is based from a photograph that I was picking up from the newspaper you know as I mentioned I've been following this event since, since the mid-1990s and this uh, photograph actually comes from about that uh, that point and as you can see the series kind of follows these figures and eventually ends there and as you can see you know you can kind of tell where the image actually or the where the series actually go. Um, and the reason that this particular photograph was important for me was because of the audience that was looking at what is happening here. Uh, because this is something that became very common in, uh, in my city, in, in Juarez. Um, and it was something that we started to, ha we had to start living with every single day of our lives. Um, and so that was very difficult to come to terms with um, growing up in in the city uh, this is the only photograph the actual photograph that I'm going to show you and this is just so that you can get a sense of what we were looking at every single day and sometimes multiple times a day uh, so as I mentioned the the city changed really radically because of this violence and it really sparked because of this official declaration of wars um, before that like I said I mean the violence already existed there but it wasn't in our in our uh, uh, point of vision or field of vision. It was just happening within them. I'm not condoning it. I'm just you know stating the truth that we were not aware of it, or rather we were, but we were not affected by it as much as uh, after the official declar declaration of war. So I'm going to change a little bit here. So I'm going to talk about about the process that I'm using, and that's because it's important with my work. Um, I try to make connections between the processes that I use with my with my images. So for these pieces, I was using a laser engraver or laser cutter, however you want to call it, and I was engraving into pieces of cardboard to be able to create the image and to burn into that cardboard and create a sooth of um, a layer of sooth into the cardboard, and then I would go back with an exact knife, as you can see on this image and selectively take some pieces out. So this is, for example, one of the plates that was done by the laser engraver, um, and then this is after I process it by hand. So, you know, even though the image was kind of created digitally, I, I was obviously appropriating images from the media and abstracting them or altering them digitally and then sending them to the machine and then uh, creating sort of like a more analog plate for me to print. Um, so when I was doing all of this, I was obviously being uh, looking at Goya and his uh, body of work of the disasters of war, where we you know with this 82 um, etchings, he was portraying the inhumanity that people do during the war times, and you know he was doing this sort of uh, to show to show society, you know, just basically how brutal we are to each other. Um, another. Uh, big influence was obviously Otto Dix and his uh, war portfolio and he was actually 
during World War One, he was a soldier, so he actually lived the scenes in person, and this something that he had to do once he came back to kind of um, be able to deal with the trauma in that way. And obviously, both of them are, are printmakers, so they use the medium to their benefit, you know, for for their images. And this is um, the reason that I'm showing them is because exactly it's exactly what I'm I was trying to do with this body of work in that I was trying to connect uh, this process that I had just you know, relatively invented myself into creating these images. Uh, so this is uh, now kind of like the, the more official body of work. I mean, the first photograph uh, that I showed the series um, is the only one that was very uh, figurative or very easy to read as far as you know how the figures are made. I made a, a decision of actually fragmenting my images after that because I wanted to talk about trauma and I wanted to talk about memory and how we want to forget these events that we were ex experiencing in the city and in the country basically every single day and as I mentioned, you know, multiple times a day sometimes. So it was uh, a decision of, uh, for me to strip all the color and just concentrate on the figure itself. And this was just a way for me to talk about the idea of how memory works in the sense that we don't remember exactly how things happen. We have a vague idea of what was there. And then they become like these fragments or this fragmented um, image that you know we try to recreate on our own mind. Particularly if you're trying to forget it, you know, there will be sometimes triggers that would make you remember something and you know for the most part if it's a, if it's a trauma that you don't you want to forget, you know those you want to avoid those triggers, but sometimes you don't you don't know what those triggers are, and when they when that image sort of appears to you, it's going to appear this way. And I will say that these pieces are actually more abstracted when you see them in person. Unfortunately, one one thing I found out is that when I show them digitally like this. Um, unfortunately they become too easy to read. So most of you probably can see the image. Um, I might be wrong on that actually because another thing that I found with this particular technique is that I can never unsee the image. Um, all these photographs, by the way, are appropriated from the media. And so I did, I, you know, I've been doing this research of trying to acquire these photographs from the newspaper, the local newspaper, or blogs now and now actually more digital. And um, they're very raw, very crude images and it's something that I just can't erase. So the moment that I see these pictures or these uh, this, uh, pieces that I've made, I see where all the details are. And after talking with people and showing them, I realized that that's really not apparent for a lot of people. Uh, the good thing about that is that, you know, it was a, it was a way for me to lure the viewer into the work and keep them there. Because I know that I'm talking about a, a really difficult subject matter and most people want to stay away from this kind of imagery because who, you know, who wants to see corpses basically, especially specifically people who have been taken out of this life in a violent way. So um, I knew that I wanted to lure the viewer and make them stay so that they can understand what is happening to the country, which is basically losing <coughs> generations of um, men, in this case, uh, between tw uh, 20 and, and 40 years old. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that I was abstracting these images and also the reason for the process, you know, because the, the process is burning the cardboard as it's creating the image, is sort of alluding to the idea that it is it's something that is a burn into our consciousness, um, and I'm talking about me uh, Mexican society, uh, that is sort of ingrained within us because we see them, we saw them, we have no option uh, to not, uh, not see them. Um, in Mexico, we're pretty open with this sort of imagery. And so at the beginning of, uh, of, the, um, of this violence, it was basically published in the newspaper front page. So even if you were not you know, walking on the street and actually running into a crime scene, you would still see it everywhere because you would see it on the newsstands. Um, obviously, you would also see it on the news if you were watching the, the, the news uh, at the time. So it was just everywhere. Um, and so this is another piece that I, um, an installation that I made uh, back in the, I guess, late 2000s. And this came about after many years of research where, as I mentioned, I've been following these stories since the, the mid-1990s. 
and uh, I'm not joking here when I say that I actually collected the newspaper even from back then and I just started collect, uh, putting them in my in my room to the point where I put them in my closet I had a small sort of like walk-in closet and there was a point where I just couldn't even go into my closet because it was piled up with these newspapers and I did it back then I didn't know what I why I was saving these images or with these stories uh, at the time I was actually doing my my bachelor's and I started sort of playing with the idea of using this uh, subject matter for my work, but it never really worked until I found this, or I, until I developed this process that I just talked about. And um, it came to a point where I just had to sort of cleanse myself and get rid of all the newspapers. <coughs> but before I did that, I actually scanned the photographs and I saved some of the, some of the articles. And when I had this opportunity to have this show, um, I wanted to show that burden that became to me of collecting these stories, of having these stacks of newspaper that basically every single one had a corpse, at least one, within, within those uh, stacks of newspaper. And it was something that it was always bugging me in the back of my head. And um, so this is the reason that I created, uh, I made a mold, obviously, of one of these stacks, and then I casted them in con concrete. And the reason for that was to show the heaviness that you know I felt uh, of you know carrying sort of like this um, this subject matter within myself. And what I did for this exhibition is I actually encouraged the people. I told the gallery to actually encourage the visitors to take um, the newspapers themselves because I um, I obviously collected some of them. I still had a, a bunch of them, as you can see. And I brought them to Austin and I put them in in the installation. And I told them. If they want to take them so they can read them at home, by all means, have them do it. Because for me, this piece was more about you know disseminating this uh, these stories and, and informing the people what was happening on the border region or in the country. Uh, and at the same time, I told them if they want to take one of those stacks, by all means, do it. Uh, there, were, there were selfish reasons for that too. I mean, I just couldn't take those back to my studio. I was gonna be moving away pretty soon and I knew I was not gonna take it. But it was actually more conceptual in the sense that I wanted them to feel the, head, the weight of those stacks um, because that was a correlation to how I felt. And they're not actually solid. They actually are hollow in the middle, but they were still pretty heavy. Um, I was very surprised, luckily, um, or pleasantly surprised rather that several people did take them and another thing that I did um, that I want to show is that I obviously hid some of the newspapers in between those stacks so I, I told the, uh, the people at the gallery that um, to encourage them to just move them so they could you know catch or be able to read the rest of the, the newspapers and I came to the show to the ex through the, uh, the, the run of the exhibition and I actually saw it in different configurations so it did get a lot of uh, traffic or a lot of interaction which is was exactly what I was looking for so I think for me it was actually a very successful piece in the end um, the, the museum slash gallery actually ended up buying the piece which was kind of great they added it to their collection uh, okay, so now this is a uh, uh, Colombian artist, Oscar Munoz, and he works with a very similar subject matter. He uh, researches um, these people who have been disappeared in Colombia because of uh, the political or also just the, uh, the guerrilla warfare that they used to have. I mean, technically they have a pact now where there's you no, know, the violence has kind of sub sub uh, sub uh, subsided um, now, so you know, theoretically it's also kind of better, but anyway, this is a still of a video that he did where he's actually drawing these portraits of uh, missing people, but he's draw drawing them with water on the, on the sidewalk. So before he finishes draw making the drawings, you can see that the portrait is actually completely erased or completely gone. And so that speaks about the ephemerality of human life and also, you know, in his case, the, the, the fact that this, pe this person is actually disappearing. Um, so when you actually see the video, it's actually pretty hard sometimes to see the full figure or the render picture like this. Um, but because of their stills, you know, you're able to see it. And the reason that I'm talking about him is because it was something that kind of helped me flesh out this second uh, series for, for the body of work that I'm doing. And this was, um, you know, after working with those laser engraved pieces, you know, you get to a point where um, you're making the work and it kind of gets to a point where you, you don't know, you don't 
you don't know if you're actually improving or if you're actually reaching your audience the way that it should be. So I had to like look at the problem from a different angle. And so this, I decided to just kind of concentrate on, on portraits and do something different with them. So m most of my, um, my work is using techniques that are uh, reductive in nature, in nature, and that's because it's uh, again associated to the concept or this idea of trying to sort of erase a human li a human life from life uh, from from this world, and because that's exactly what the cartels are trying to do, and it's also what the officials are trying to do. They're trying to erase these cartels, you know, from from the country, supposedly to, for the good of, of the society. Um, so that's kind of like the relation that I'm trying to look in within these pieces. So for these ones, I decided to use a chemical erasure. And so uh, they're basically just uh, kind of like tone and transverse, where I was trying to recreate or transfer the portrait from these people onto another substrate, but at the same time, it was kind of being erased, you know, through, this, through the process. Um, so that's kind of what made me think of uh, Oscar Munoz and his body of work and how it all it all kind of worked out. And again, it's sort of abstractions of these portraits because they are these decaying bodies. You know, we all are going to decay eventually once we, you know, once era, when it, once it's our time to pass into another life. You know, that's what's going to happen to all of us. And just also kind of try to talk about the violence of that this body kind of went through. What scale are these? Um, the previous ones, uh, they were 22 by 30s. These ones are actually a bit smaller. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think they're about 12 by 14 inches. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, talking about, again, um, just this idea of uh, kind of fragmenting the, um, the event that happened, you know. As I mentioned, you know, we would just run into these crime scenes without wanting to run into them, and you would see these fragments of people, you know, fragments of their faces or their bodies, depending on where, how, how far along was the um, the crime scene unit um, involved with. So this is another Mexican artist. Her name is Teresa Margolles, and this is an actual uh, cinder block wall from her home in Culiacán. Not from her home, but from her home state, Culiacán. And this is basically the aftermath of uh, a battle between a cartel, mem cartel members and the police. So it's basically a shout out wall. Um, this is a close up of it. And she, you know, she convinced the people who own the wall to basically take it and just display it all over the world in museums and galleries. Also, again, just to bring light into what's happening into our country. Um, and it's just, uh, it's something that I went after seeing this piece, um, it also just kind of sparked something different in me as far as like what I wanted to do. You know, again, because my subject matter is essentially the same that I'm following but I kind of feel like I need to approach it different ways because one, as an artist, you know, we get bored of using the same processes and two, you don't know if that's the right sort of answer, you know, or the way to show it to the, to the viewer if it's going to work out that way. So after working with those two previous bodies of work, I was, I was in need of, do, you know, figuring something else. So going back again to the portraiture, um, I decided to blow up these portraits now and Thinking of this shout out wall, I thought, well, why, what if I actually try to erase the figure one pixel at a time using a hand drill? And that's exactly what you're looking at here. So this is a studio shot of well, what I was doing um, at the time. And the idea behind this was, you know, again, trying to erase these people from the earth. But at the same time, I'm using erasure not as uh, destructive, but rather as a cleansing, which means bringing some, something else out of it. You know, when you erase an image, you don't end up actually with nothing. You end up with another substrate. And in this case, it's the absence of these people. Um, so that's exactly what I'm trying to explore here. Um, I'm trying to erase these memories or trying to erase these, um, these crimes that have been you know, committed in, in, in the country but I always end up with something else. And as you can see, there's, I end up with something uh, that shows or portrays the violence. 
and that's kind of what I'm looking for so that I can translate that to the viewer. So for these pieces, there's several variations. I mean, this is the more straightforward variation where I have the matrix of the piece and then I have a backing um, of the of the of a white piece uh, that I'm drilling through. So I'm, I'm using this uh, matrix, which is just basically a Xerox print um, to be able to kind of follow the, that pattern and create that image and try to erase it. it I'm going to be honest, at the beginning mm -hmm. I didn't think that um, these figures were actually going to be as readable as they are. Um, I, you know, a lot of the, a lot of it just comes with the process in that you come up with unexpected results and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. In my case, they actually kind of worked out. So this is one, of, uh, this is just a white piece of paper on its own. And you know, being a printmaker, I'm I've, I'm always thinking, oh, I gotta make editions, or I wanna have multiples. And in my case, I wasn't trying, I wasn't looking for editions. Actually, I was looking for multiples. The reason for this is because after looking at all these pictures of the crime scenes, I started to realize the body can only fall in certain in so many ways. And so, a lot of the times, I would look at one image, and it would remind me of another image of another crime many years ago or in a different state in Mexico that look almost exactly the same and obviously because you know we were all we we're all Mexicans you know we kind of have a, um, a sort of look as well and so it is just something that looked almost additionable in a sense you know it's like a repetition of the same thing so that was kind of my reasoning of creating this sort of sandwich of paper as I was drilling uh, so this is a black variation and this is just basically white uh, black paper and all the dust that you see there is basically um, the dust from the drywall backing that I was using. Now the reason that I was using drywall backing is uh, because I needed something soft but at the same time hard to be able to drill through because I was going to be dealing with very small drill bits to be able to create those, those uh, half tones. And I tried wood at the beginning obviously and also again thinking as a printmaker I thought maybe I can use it as a block and print from that. But I just found out that it was too too hard for me to drill through, and it was just going to take too much energy, physical energy. And I was more interested in actually creating uh, a larger body of work so that I would be able to show more images to the um, you know to the viewer. But what I did find with this drywall backing, but though, was that it actually was the one that captured the violence or the energy the most, as you can see on this on this slide. Um, Interestingly enough, the paper held much better. It was stronger than the drywall. So I um, decided to obviously photograph them as well because they are really interesting. That's a close up of it so you can see, you know, really nice uh, fine details of all the different drill bits that I was using and how, how bad it actually um, ended up getting abused basically. So, you know, again, trying to tie concept with uh, the process itself. The fact that I was using um, a hand drill, which obviously is shaped like a gun, was not lost on me. Now, I'm not mentioning that to say that I'm using it as sort of as a surrogate to kind of think or put myself in the shoes of you know the perpetrators um, and trying to like you know feel what it would be to kill somebody. That was not part of my thinking, but definitely I was whenever I was making this or whenever I'm making these pieces, it is something that is in my mind. It's something that. I know that this is happening and I know that, um, you know, unfortunately this is, you know, close to what it kind of feels, you know, uh, piercing a body um, and just kind of taking a life. So another reason that I decided to do multiples of each piece was because so that I was able to create the stencils where I would be able to, you know, transfer them into any other sub, uh, sub, uh, substrate. And so this is basically just the stencil itself after I uh, printed it with or sprayed through it. And then this is the actual piece directly on the wall. Now the reason that I'm using uh, copper tone uh, spray paint in this case is because they, in Mexico we have a saying and it's, it, it goes, uh, estás, enseñando, estás sacando el cobre. Which if you translate it literally to English, it, it's uh, you're showing the copper, which is basically the equivalent to you're showing your true colors and so in this case you know I was thinking about these people and who they are and um, I'm not I'm, I will be upfront I'm not making any judgments on these people um, 
all these portraits that I'm showing you, this is just an installation shot, <coughs> all these portraits that I'm showing you actually come from innocent bystanders, from cartel members, and also from members of the uh, authorities. And the reason that I don't make any distinction and I will never say who is who is because that's not important to me. I'm not anyone to judge them on their decisions. To me, what's important is the fact that they were somebody's brother, somebody's father, somebody's uncle, and the fact that we're losing these generations of men in the country. And so, you know, bringing into light this idea of, you know, the, the showing your true colors, it's directly related to the fact that unfortunately in Mexico, we have a lot of corrupt, uh, corrupt policemen or, you know, we have this idea that most of the policemen are corrupt. And so that's sort of what I'm trying to allude with that. Again, it's not necessarily a judgment, it's just something, unfortunately, it comes with our culture that way. Um, these are now just gonna be basically installation shots of you know, how I've been um, exhibiting these pieces in different, in different spaces, and also to give you a sense of the scale. These pieces are roughly 30, 38 by 50 inches. Um, so as you can see, they're pretty large, and they, you know, they kind of scream at the viewer. Um, and they're in their face. And when you see them very up close, they kind of become abstracted as well. Uh, but when you see them from afar, you're actually able to uh, look at all the details and actually be able to look at the image very clearly. Um, and as you can see, I show all the different variations. Another reasoning for the different variations of paper, you know, the, the black, the white, the copper, all that is, I was also thinking about the body itself, you know being thinking about mortality and what happens to our body after we're, we're dead um, you know we have these different layers we have the skin we have our muscles we have our bones theoretically we have a soul right so it's all these different layers that I was also playing with um, all these different layers of paper and I'm kind of assigning you know those different layers into my process as well it kind of helps me go through the motions of uh, creating the work I've been able to actually show or make larger pieces um, so this is one of those large pieces that I made I believe this is um, uh, 8 by 16 if I'm not mistaken feet um, horizontal obviously as you can see and I was fortunate enough to actually be able to do a larger one and so this is obviously I could not do it in one single shot so I had to tile it um, so there was just a studio shot and then this is me kind of installing it as you can see this was uh, done a while ago and I still had short hair um, it was really fun being on that um, cherry picker to <laughs> install the work um, and then this is a detail again of, the, of that black piece. Now, these pieces evolve every time I show them. Uh, one really lucky um, thing that happened through this process was that the drywall dust kind of sticks to the paper. Even though there's no adhesive, nothing, it sticks for some reason to the paper enough where, you know, every time I move them, there's still some residue of that uh, dry the drywall. And every time I show it, you know, some of that dust comes down. So like the show that if you go to see it at Snap, you will see some of that dust and you will see some of it eventually on the floor, you know, when the pieces get moved and everything. But it's still very resilient. I mean, it still stays enough. And that's something that I really like uh, that happens on my work because it means that the piece is evolving. Just again, you know, making the connection between the process to the, sub to the idea that our bodies are gonna deteriorate over time. So that's exactly what's happening to my pieces. They're deteriorating over time. Um, and this is just an installation shot to kind of show you how big that piece was. Um, unfortunately, this is the only time I've been able to exhibit it. I've shown half of it in another space, but unfortunately not. There's no big galleries with, or museums with large walls, or at least I don't get invited. <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, okay, so now this is a bit more recent. I was invited to back to Austin, Texas um, by Flatbed Press and to collaborate and, make and publish some work. So obviously this time, not necessarily my decision, they wanted an actual edition so that you know they can sell it. And so uh, uh, I said, well, why don't I just continue doing what I do, but 
sort of for real as a print this time. And so we decided to uh, do the same thing, you know, hand drill portraits, but using MDF this time. I mean, wood was definitely gonna be too hard because I told him from the get go, it's like, look, one of the reasons I don't make prints anymore is because I just can't. You know, physically I'm, I'm by myself, I don't, have, I don't have the money to pay an assistant, you know, to help me do this. So um, they were like, well, let's try MDF and see if it works. Uh, it worked beautifully. It was still pretty hard though, uh, but it, as you can see, I was able to pull it off. And then they were kind enough to print for me, which was awesome. Uh, I really recommend that if you get an, uh, an opportunity to, to have assistants do the work for you, you just make the image and then they do the rest. It's, it's amazing. Uh, so I'm just going to show you a few shots of that happening. You know, here I was just basically drinking beer and watching them do all the work. <laughs> um, so that's a, uh, that's a uh, uh, first proof that we got out, out of that block. And the size is exactly the same. You will see actually this piece at the snap show as well. Um, we did a couple. So this here we were proofing the second plate. And then we did our, a third piece, but we wanted to try, or I rather, I wanted to try something different. I wanted to do an etching or aquatint or an intaglio piece, basically. Mm -hmm. And I told them, look, if you're a game, let me drill through copper and make it, make it that way so that I can have, um, you know, embossment. So it's kind of bridging my two techniques that I sort of developed for these bodies of work, you know, the laser engraver technique and then this hand drill technique. And, you know, fortunately enough, I was actually dreading drilling through the copper, but it's really soft and it actually went like butter. Um, it, it's actually, it was actually even softer than MDF. That was a nice touch that I found. So I'm actually hoping to make more of this in the future. So those are just kind of details. Uh, we actually had to deeper all, every single hole, which was so painful. Uh, but again, I wasn't doing it, so that was great. <laughs> and then the only, the only part that really was terrible for me was that I had to do several stencils of the same image to be able to create tones that way. So this is uh, one paper stencil that I used for blocking some areas. And then we did some aqua tint, as you can see here. So this one already has several layers. It had the red layer first, and then we aqua tinted it, and then we did another layer with the greens, um, and then we aqua tinted that as well. Uh, so you can see this is the other, another one of those um, stencils. So it was still a lot of work for me. I mean, I had to do this image like three times before we actually got to proof it or actually put it on the plate. Uh, so this is them proofing that piece. Um, and then that's the finished piece, which you will also be able to, uh, to see at the, um, at the snap show. Um, and so we co-published these pieces. Um, and so now I'm gonna shift gears here. I've been talking about this body of work, which has been basically consuming my artistic life. And that's because it's something that I have to do. I really don't have any other explanation than that. It's just I need to do this body of work because it's important to me. It, 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 I, sh I saw the city change, I saw, um, I saw the country change, and I don't think I'll ever be able to stop making body of, this body of work. But in the meantime, I've been working with other things. Uh, most of them don't, pound, don't pan out into anything because there's just, I feel like there's just basically breaks for me, in all honesty. You know, I get to a point doing my research and looking at these images that they just become so heavy that there's a point where it's like, I can't look at that work anymore and I can't really read any more of these articles because it's just emotionally it's too much, uh, which is actually good. Because one thing that happened to me was that I actually got desensitized looking at these images and reading of these stories. And I got to a point where I just, you know, I was looking at the videos even, and it did nothing to me. And I realized this is bad. Because if I, I'm, I'm, if I'm at that point, this is, I'm, then I'm not doing anything. I mean, I'm just regurgitating what I'm seeing without any emotion. Eventually, it sensitized me even further, which is uh, kind of great. But anyway, so uh, one thing that did actually work out for me was I was invited to Germany for a residency and I visited this place, which is a museum where basically rocket technology was developed. This is a facility that dates back to the World War II era. And this is in the island of Penemunde in Germany. And this is the power plant where they were creating energy to be able to develop these rockets. Now these rockets were actually to bombard the Allies, obviously, so this was the Nazis building these uh, rockets 
to as uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, fortunately, they were never able to finish them in time, um, and so we were actually kind of lucky that you know they were not. So actually, Werner von Braun, who ended up working at NASA eventually and being instrumental to put the men on the moon, this is uh, where he actually worked, and he was actually the leader, the lead scientist for this particular project. Um, so I was invited. Um, by another artist to come and basically do a residency there because this artist had seen the space, he loved it, and he wanted to do something with it. So we spoke with another curator or director of another museum and he kind of put us in touch with the museum and we basically got the, got the okay to come and do a residency over a summer. Uh, this was two years ago. So as you can see, you know, thinking as a printmaker, um, I just wanted to transfer something onto paper or something onto substrate. Um, and more than anything, this was a very daunting project for me. One, because it was completely different from what I've been doing, and because of the the burden of the history of the space. I mean, it's this is a, a Nazi um, is a, um, building, basically, and there was a uh, concentration camp, not a death camp, but uh, they definitely used slave labor to, to make uh, for the for uh, for the labor, so I had to be careful about it, and so I just I made the conscious choice of I'm not going to use anything figurative. I'm just going to talk about this space and you know what it is that it's there. So you know again, you going back and just kind of finding whatever I could from the space and kind of transferring the history of the space into paper or into some sort of substrate. So these are from photographs that I took of the space that you saw at the beginning. Um, and I used an actual call that uh, they were using back then for you know making this power plant run, and I started just creating this you know, these pieces, transferring the call into into paper. And what I'm try what I was trying or what I was thinking for these pieces was basically um, thinking on memory and thinking on this, um, trying to capture like specific moments that uh, you know are fleeting but they are important in, in our history, which is basically what I'm doing for um, my body of work in of Mexico. You know, it's essentially the same, so there's a lot of different connections. So I was thinking very, uh, very similar, uh, but the body of work and the, and the, con the content obviously was completely different. Um, for this uh, gray piece, this is actual ash that I found from, or that I made from wood from the area, and then I burned it, I created the ash, and then I used those you know, to also create stencils and transfer the ash into, into different substrates and just kind of, you know, creating, replicating some of these structures. And then I just, wa I just wanted to capture the essence of this space. So I decided to work with a cyanotype technique and so I decided to make my own films on, on the spot and, and also do my, my cyanotypes on the spot. So you can see that, you know, I was using um, just what I found on the space. Um, and putting it on top of the sensitive paper and be able to create pieces that way. Um, they had a lot of um, rusted metal because it's, it's an interesting thing, even though this is a museum now for, it's a technical museum, it's not an art museum, so it's more about uh, talking about the history of the space and what it, had, what it did at the time, and which is a really great thing that the Germans are they're good for. You know, they own their, their crimes and they really try to show them to anybody to inform so that we can learn from our mistakes. I mean, they really are trying, they really tried really hard to learn from their mistakes. So this is what this space is all about. You know, it, it talks about the, the gruesomeness of that, you know, of that period. And then, you know, eventually they also talk about landing on the moon because of Werner von Braun. But uh, at the same time, a lot of the structures, they just kind of let them run its course of life. So that's why they have a lot of um, uh, rusted metal. So thinking of all those colors and just kind of picturing myself, you know, what was happening, what would have been to be there and seeing these experiments, you know, because they were, I started, I read a lot about Bernard von Braun and I read a lot about the, the, this, this place. And basically it was a research facility where they were uh, exploring rocket technology. So obviously there were a lot of explosions and a lot of the rockets just basically exploded all the time because they were not able to get them up in the air um, and effective. So those w that's where the colors come from. And these are actually just the films, but I knew that I wanted to have them more as just films and that I wanted them to be also pieces themselves. But that's what we're, I was using for creating the cyanotype. And my reasoning here was kind of like, you know, playing with this idea of 
you know the the Nazis and then also the Allies. So the cyanotype technique ended up being part of you know sort of seeing this aerial photography that the Allies once they caught up to the that they were doing this, you know they would send reconnaissance um, uh, airplanes to you know figure out what they were doing and try to you know stop them. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few pieces that I made, and then. Uh, I was invited by the museum to actually have an exhibition there of the resulting work, which was great. This was actually a mini installation that we tried for another exhibition in their space. The curator of the exhibition, of the space, actually liked our work so much that he invited us for this. So this is actually a historical exhibition in that, again, it, ta it talks about the space and what happened in that space. So this is the actual uh, warhead of the, um, uh, of the, of the rocket. And this is the map of the island, and then you know he ha they have the graphs of whatever they were, you know they were doing at the time, and then just they included our work within the space. So that's a close-up of the installation, and I use it as a sort of as a test run for what I wanted to do for the final installation because I had a big space, uh, and this is what it looks like on the inside. This is the other artist that worked with me at the time, Gregorio Iglesias Mayo, um, and here we're just basically running through the facilities. I mean it's basically a big factory. It was a, re a power plant uh, back then, and they just preserve it so that people can see it. So now this is what I ended up doing for the final exhibition. We were actually put, placed into the actual uh, facility of the power plant. They do have ex uh, exhibition galleries, as you saw on, on, on the mini installation that I made. But um, for the actual exhibition, they decided to put us on this uh, on the actual the actual factory. Um, so this is just to kind of give you a scale of the pieces. Um, and it ended up uh, being received really well. I mean, I was obviously very scared of what was happening with, you know, if people were going to understand what I was trying to do with capturing sort of like the essence of, uh, you know, the, the explosions and the recognance and, you know, the history of the space. But um, fortunately, I was told that um, people really like my, uh, like them. They really feel that it's um, it, it became part of the factory, which uh, I'm actually kind of glad because that was what I was going for, you know, so that it would blend with the decay that the space is actually having, but at the same time, you know, it would have this artistic aspect to it. And then back here, you can see a little bit of um, Gregorio's work. Unfortunately, I keep forgetting to include some of his work, and I really should, but he created a huge canvas uh, where he painted, and his work was going to be more figurative, obviously, as you can see. And that's why I kind of went the other way around. I was like, I don't want to compete with him. Not because I couldn't, it's just that I wanted to do something different. So another thing that I um, made was these panels for windows. Because they are now a museum and they're supported by the state, they have to preserve pretty much anything. Uh, or, you know, to a certain degree, as I said, some things they do let, let them run their course. But because these were actually part of the installation of the buildings that they're trying to preserve, they had to preserve these window frames. Uh, but they have them in these awkward spaces where you know everybody just kind of forgets about them and not, don't see them. Uh, but they have these beautiful stands. So as soon as I saw them, I, I asked the curator, I said, can I use them? Can I play something in them? And he gave me the okay, so I ended up basically creating sort of like these windows um, into you know the explosions that people would be seeing all the workers you know once they were testing this this rockets and just to uh, I'm gonna back a little bit fast just to re uh, show you their actual rocket so I forgot to talk about that so these are the rockets that they were developing this is the V1 V comes from vengeance and then the V2 um, um, yeah so just to give you a sense and I'm running out of time, but don't worry, I'm gonna make it. <laughs> oh, I had more of those. So yeah, so that's one, and then that's just another view. And then I, they had a larger one, which I also ended up using. So kind of using the same uh, the same sort of technique of creating those stencils. Um, I did made those, and then just installation shots, I was able to actually show these pieces in another museum in a more sort of formal way, I guess. <laughs> Um, so this is kind of what I'm showing. And the great thing about it is that we were able to publish a book. Uh, so you can actually buy this book through Amazon. Um, and yeah, it's, it's basically worldwide. I have some copies myself to sell. Unfortunately, I don't have any with me. I only brought a small suitcase, so I don't have any. But if you're interested, you can always contact me or you can just buy it off through Amazon. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's both in English and German and it covers 
the history of the space and then it covers both our sort of profiles and what we were doing while we were there. So I, I'm really proud of this publication and of the project itself. And I actually recently heard that the museum is considering buying the pieces and making them permanent installations because, I mean, I feel like that piece is not going to work anywhere else rather than there. I mean, I can show it somewhere else and explain the, 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 the idea or what I was doing, but it's just never going to function the same way that as when it's there. So I'm really hoping that they consider that. All right, so now go, going back to Mexico, um, kind of this is sort of like, <coughs> so excuse me, like, uh, this is sort of like my new thinking or kind of where my body of my work is kind of going moving forward. I'm kind of stepping out of the body and moving into a different kind of body, which are the houses. One thing that happened um, to me, uh, or rather to the city, but that I started noticing is that the, the, the landscape of the, the architecture of the city has changed. Um, as you can see, or you may not be thinking, but this is an actual house. It's not a fortress, it's not a jail, um, a prison, it's an actual house, an actual home. But because of the violence, you know, people had to basically get rid of all the windows and just put layers of security. Um, you can actually see the layers of security here. You know, these were obviously the original mm -hmm. fans, and you know, you may try to make them nice so you can have a nice home. But then, because of the violence throughout the years, you know, you have to start adding the racial wire, and then it just violence just kind of doesn't go away. So you kind of have to add an electric fence on the roof, and this is something that happened over time. Um, so these are just different layers of security that people had to do in their own homes. And it's something that I actually kind of, I didn't notice um, right away. Um, I left Juarez to do my masters, but I was coming back every break that I had to visit my mom, my family. And I remember the first time I came back after leaving, uh, she picked me up from the airport in El Paso because it was easier that way, and then uh, we drove back to Juarez. And I remember entering the, crossing the bridge and entering into the city, I asked my mom immediately, what happened to the city in this four months that I was gone? And she just kind of looked at me and she told me, what are you talking about? And I just couldn't believe, uh, she told me it's exactly the same as when you left. And <coughs> I couldn't believe it. I had chilled myself. Um, that I didn't see how bad this, this city looked like. It looked like a ghost town, and even though it's a two million, um, two million uh, people living in the city, it just, it was empty in the streets. Uh, old businesses were, most businesses were closed down. Houses looked like prisons. And I, I saw this happening, but it didn't, it didn't click. I needed that uh, distance to be able to see it. Um, so that's where, you know, this sort of uh, body of work is coming from in that realizing that we had to protect ourselves. Obviously, we, had, we have to continue living our life, but we don't want to live with this violence in our, in our mind, in our, in, in our daily life. So we intentionally shield ourselves and we try not to think about it. And we confirm and that's something that I just cannot grasp with. Um, I mean going to extremes of putting spikes all over your roof on your house. Wow. It's just something that I cannot cope with still. I mean, I cannot understand. Um, so yeah, these photographs are just to show what's going on. And this is still, I mean, the violence in Juarez has to, uh, is, is not as bad as it used to be, but really the, the problem in Mexico hasn't changed. It just kind of moved from one city to the next or from one state to the next and it kind of dies down for a little bit and then it kind of spikes up again um, and I don't see the end of it to be honest uh, and I'm hopeful and but I don't have any answers I, I also want to mention that I, the work, I'm doing this work because it's important to show people and to show our, the audiences of what it is that we're living not me anymore unfortunately but what my family my friends are living and the state of uh, sort of horror and um, I don't know how else to put it honestly that you know we have to deal with uh, while trying to live a purposeful and happy life. Um, it got to a point where streets were actually closed off by the neighbors you know 
people just got together and said, look, let's just create gated communities, even though they were not. Uh, so it's actually funny in a sad way. There's a ton of gated communities now all over Juarez that basically just people put illegal fences blocking out streets. I mean, this used to be a street that you could just go through anytime you want. You want it and now you can't. And so for example, where my mom lives, uh, which is where I grew up and you know, sort of my home still, um, now we kind of have to go to it just one way. You know, take a one specific path to get to her to the house, because all the other houses around around us they kind of secluded themselves and created this gated community, so that there's only one entrance and one exit. And the reason for that was because the violence got to a point. The violence got to a point where they were just doing shootouts. You know, they would uh, drive to drive-bys. You know, go through a house and then just ram the whole house with um, riddled with bullets and then leave. And so this is to avoid those kind of things. Um, and I believe this is my last um, slide. But I also want to mention again, even though we have to create these la layers of um, security, we want to forget about it. So of course we decorate them. Feliz Navidad, Merry Christmas. I mean, how sad is this? You know, having uh, Christmas lights on a razor wire fence that shouldn't be there to begin with. Um, um, I have now another one. Again, Christmas lights. And yep, that's it. Thanks.